Hello, everybody. I am so happy that you chose to join us again today. Uh, let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come once again saying thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for your grace and your mercy that have kept us. We ask that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your fresh as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Alrighty, we are still on article number 11, The Perseverance of Saints. And our author writes, We believe that such only are real believers as endure unto the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. If you recall, we have ventured out from our main scripture of John the 8th chapter, verse 31 and 32, and we are currently on what I call the scenic route. Uh, and the purpose is to take a fresh look at how much the Father loves the whole world, even those who do not love him. And then we took a pause. Uh, so we took a pause to take a look at John, the third chapter, verse 16. And rather than jumping right into the verse, we chose to walk somewhat slowly uh, and walk our way into it, starting with the first verse. And then around verse 10, uh, we paused again to ponder uh, a question. Why would Jesus choose Nicodemus, a Pharisee, to give information that would change the world. And so in previous lessons, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I've tried to look into the headspace of a Pharisee. And we saw that uh, they were pious or self-righteous. They were stout religionists. Uh, the Pharisees was a body of the most passionate religionists of that day. They had intense seriousness, intense dedication, and intense passion. They were zealous. They probably, you probably wouldn't invite them to your party. But, but along with all that, they were also self-righteous, heartless, and they were critical. They never had a sense of need for repentance, nor did they see themselves as sinners. They were self-appointed keepers of the law, to which they had tacked on thousands of man-made laws, customs, and traditions. And they held those customs and traditions in higher regard than they did the God's law. And so Jesus called them a bunch of hypocrites and told the people to beware of them. Uh, they were constantly following Jesus and trying to find fault in him. And, and Jesus openly went about doing the work of the Father who sent him. He, he was not deterred by the, by the uh, Pharisees, the teacher of the law, nor by their customs and traditions. He was not scared. He ate with sinners. He healed on the Sabbath and taught the people the word of God. He taught and healed on mountains, in the valley, in the temples, on the lakes, and pretty much wherever he was, which made the Pharisees and the teachers of the law furious. Luke 6 and 7 says the Pharisees and teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath, which of course he did. And then in John the 7th chapter, during the Feast of Tabernacles, as usual, a crowd was following Jesus. And the Pharisees were in the crowd, as usual waiting for an opportunity to accuse Jesus of something. They overheard the talk of the crowd and the people were putting their faith in, in, in Jesus. The, the people listened to what he said and, and then they observed what he did. Then they reasoned within themselves that he had to 
be the Christ. Because nobody would, nobody would or could do more than he had already done. So then, in an effort to once and all, once and for all, put an end to Jesus, the Pharisees and the chief priests sent temple guards to arrest Jesus and bring him back to them. Now, this is how powerful the word of God is. The guards, the temple guards, went to arrest Jesus, but instead, Jesus arrested them with the word of God. All things considered, it should have been easy for them to arrest Jesus because, you know, he wasn't hiding. He was right in the open, but they didn't. Apparently, instead of arresting him, they listened to him. And because they listened, they believed his message. And so when they returned to the Pharisees and the chief priests without Jesus, they asked, why didn't you bring him? And they replied, no one's ever spoke the way this man does. In other words, they confessed that Jesus was more than just a mere man. They said, no man speaks as he does. They were arrested by the word of God, spoken by the Son of God. The word of God is so powerful, it can flow through a person who is not moved by it to one that is. Here's what I mean. A person can be in the presence of the word, of the word being preached or the word being taught, but that person's heart is hard. And the, and the message just makes them mad. And then they will, for spite, you know, like go into somebody and say, you know what they said. And they, re they will repeat what was said to somebody else. And that person responds to it in a positive manner and is helped while the person who originally heard it was not. The leaders refused to hear the message that was presented by Jesus. They instead labeled him as not being from God. They felt that Jesus couldn't be from God. Why? Because he wasn't like them. Did you feel that? I felt that ouch. I felt that today. We are so guilty of labeling people based on our beliefs and our traditions and our customs, acting as though we have it all right. So if they are not like me, then that means they wrong. You, you ever think about that? If Jesus was on this earth, you, you ever think that if he was on this earth right now, surely he would be a Democrat. Then, of course, if you're a Republican, you would think if Jesus was on this earth, surely he would be a Republican. But the reality is he would be neither. He, he would be neither, nor would he be an independent or have any other affiliations to any any kind of religious party or political party. Think about it. Jesus was all about the heart, the inner person. His aim always hit the inner man. It didn't matter if you were male or female, slave or free, rich or poor, Jew or Gentile, or anything else in between. He dealt with those in authority and he dealt with those under authority. He, he didn't get bogged down in politics or religious stuff. He was all about us being born again, no matter what or who the person was. His aim was not to start a revolution to set the captives free. His weapons of warfare was God's mighty weapons that are more powerful or that are powerful enough to pull down strongholds. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, that God's weapons 
can bring down every argument against him and every wall that can be built to keep men from finding him. With God's weapons, rebels can be captured and brought back to God and changed into men whose hearts desire is obedience to God. That's what happened to Paul. Jesus knew that his battle was not with flesh and blood, even though it was flesh that he was dealing with. The attack from the enemy was part of a large satanic campaign trying to destroy the work of God. Jesus was dealing with walls of resistance in the minds of the Pharisees, teachers of the law, and the religious leaders. And because these folk were the keepers of the law and tradition, they were teaching the people their ways instead of God's ways. But Jesus, through God's word, which is a strong weapon of warfare, was pulling down walls of resistance in the minds of the people. He was pulling down reasonings that were opposed to the truth of God's word. Through the word of God, Jesus pulled down the reasoning that the temple guards came with, which allowed them to accept the truth. In dealing with the Pharisees and the likes, Jesus was not attacking their intelligence, but their intellectualism, which is the high-minded attitude that makes people think that they know more than they really do. Therefore, when the temple guards returned to the Pharisees and the chief priests without Jesus, instead of the chief priests and the, uh, and the Pharisees, instead of them really listening to their report uh, of what they had heard and seen that convinced them that Jesus was not just a mere man, instead of them listening to that and, and possibly changing their heart, that wall of resistance in the minds of the leaders did not bulge. You can hear their sarcasm in their, in their comments. In verse 47, it says, Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Then the next statement really shows their high-mindedness. They asked the question, Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? In other words, they're saying, you need to be like us. If you want to know what's right, you can believe what we believe. They would have probably sent these men back again with a do or die order to arrest Jesus. If it were not for our friend Nicodemus, the Pharisee, who put in his two cents. Nicodemus asked the question, does our law judge a man before it hears him? and knows what he's doing. Nicodemus, being one of them, he knew that they had already passed judgment and was going to arrest Jesus without even a trial. They just wanted Jesus dead and they didn't care how, how it happened. They were ready to get him out of the way any means possible. Of course, when Nicodemus said this, they shot back at him. Are you a, from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has come out of Galilee. They knew that Nicodemus was right, so they refused to answer his questions. Instead, they attacked him personally. Now, if you have been paying any attention in this heated political season that we're in, you have seen this type of attack used often. Turns out, this is an ancient debate trick. It, 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 it's when you cannot answer the argument, when you cannot answer the argument, attack the speaker. In, in other words, just ignore the facts. Even ignore the issue. Just throw out personal attacks. Just, just keep throwing them out, throwing them out, throwing them out, and, 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 and ignore the issue. But once again, so this is not a new tactic that we see practically every day. But once again, we see that there's nothing new under the sun. Solomon in Ecclesiastes says, 
uh, in the first chapter, verse nine and ten, he says, "What has been, what has been, will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which you can say, look, this is something new? If it was here already, long ago, it was here." before our times. So all the stuff that we're seeing now, it's nothing new. It, it's been there. This whole thing with uh, takes place, uh, this whole thing uh, with, with the temple guards and Nicodemus standing up, this whole thing takes place sometime after Nicodemus encounter with Jesus by night. But it shows that Nicodemus had been doing a great deal of thinking and possibly even studying since that night with Jesus. And with that, it puts us back on the main road. I can hear you virtually saying, but wait, you didn't answer the big question. Why a Pharisee? To which I will say, how observant are you of you? And, and, I, and I'm going to withhold my answer until a little bit farther in the lesson. Hey, but that does not stop you from coming up with your own answer. I've laid the groundwork for my answer, but you might come up with something different than me. So now we're back on the main road, back to verse 11 of John, the third chapter. And it says, I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But you, but still you people do not accept our testimony. This is just me digressing. Can you imagine if Jesus was in our day using language like you people? We would all have, we would have all kinds of protests just because he said you people. But as I said, I digress. And, and that just jumped out at me. But anyway, Jesus goes on to say in verse 12, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Remember that Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus about the new birth. Even though he did not know what it, what it was, Nicodemus' heart was touched and he desired to know. The great tragedy was that he was the master of Israel, yet did not know about spiritual things. So at this point in the life of Nicodemus, he did not believe and he did not receive Jesus. He, he was trying to receive Jesus in the natural, but the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2 and 14 says, For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But note the strong language used by Jesus. He says, I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. I thank God that through our Lord Jesus Christ, that when truth speaks to a heart that is open, it does eventually get in. And with that, loved ones, I bid you farewell for now. Until next time, may the grace of our Lord and G Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And let us all say together, amen. Be safe. And I hope you have a safe holiday. I hope you opt to celebrate safely rather than according to traditions. Uh, until next time, see you and be blessed. Thank you. Bye-bye.